about so i'm justin murray from technical marketing at vmware and uh, i'll let my colleague mohan briefly introduce himself here Hi, I'm Mohan Pateri. I'm a staff solutions architect, and I focus on AI ML along with my partner, Justin, here. The two of us are uh, doing a lot of these machine learning broadcasts and uh, uh, VM Live, so it's, it's good to have you listening to us here. Uh, we're, dealing, we're dealing with a very important topic here, the topic of healthcare research, and the, uh, the context for all of this work we're describing is really the research lab, the development lab, not, not clinical diagnostics. This is purely for development reasons here that uh, we're going to show you this. And this was a, a piece of technology built by NVIDIA with the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, that we use at the center of this work. It's a machine learning algorithm that takes images and that makes decisions based on those images. And we'll show you that in detail. Uh, but always remember throughout this talk that this is a, a research R&D piece of work here. This is not clinically proven or, or validated. Um, so uh, disclaimer here, standard disclaimer from VMware, there are some features that we're going to mention in this talk that are future features, um, and we'll point those out as we go along. Uh, so um, the usual disclaimers apply from VMware here for this. So our agenda then is to talk about the partnership with NVIDIA, uh, which is the basis for all of this. And you can think of this work we're going to describe as one component of that partnership. It's a very wide ranging partnership, but essentially it's about taking AI to the enterprise together. And as you know, NVIDIA is a leader in accelerators and a leader in AI slash machine learning. VMware has partnered up with NVIDIA in a big way, as you heard about at VMworld, and we'll talk about that next. Um, we'll first of all lay the ground for you to understand why VMware plays a role in this with uh, GPU support on vSphere. There are several different ways of doing it, and my colleague Mohan will go into two ways of doing it that we actually used in this work. And then we'll talk about machine learning with the Clara framework from the NGC. The NGC is the NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is their portal, their storage place for a multitude of healthcare frameworks healthcare trained models, uh, and a multitude of other frameworks as well to do with robotics or chat, uh, uh, live chat uh, understanding, recommendation engines, a lot of uh, technology there available to you for development of machine learning. And all of that will be on uh, Tanzu on vSphere in the future. We'll talk about another project as well, distributed training with Apache Spark 3, which also applied to the healthcare situation and we'll we'll go into that at the end of the talk and give you some resources that you can look at as well so what is this partnership about uh, at the executive summary level uh, nvidia and vmware want to bring ai machine learning to the enterprise together and who better to do that than the company that has all of the attention in the accelerator world for M machine learning and the company that has a big presence in the data center as well. So NVIDIA brings that leadership in the AI ML ecosystem. We at VMware bring the presence in the data center. This is a great combination. And uh, our intention is to do a lot of innovation together. And you're going to see innovation around GPUs today from NVIDIA and VMware. But also there's a lot of innovation going on in the smart network interface card area, smart NICs area, uh, which I'll briefly mention next. We won't talk too much about that today. We will mention something to do with networking, but that, that would be the subject for a future VM Live, possibly the smart NICs area. So NVIDIA's overall view of the world is it breaks down into the CPU area, the GPU area for bulk data processing for machine learning. GPUs are pretty much essential for the type of machine learning we're going to be talking about here. And of course, NVIDIA excels at that, having been a big player in graphics in the past, they're now a big player, the big player in machine learning. And finally, this concept of a DPU or data processing unit. What is that exactly? Well, as you know, um, Mellanox, the high-speed networking company, very high-speed networking company, uh, was acquired by NVIDIA a few months back. And this is the result of that. This is the idea of where the GPU offloads computation from the CPU, uh, takes all the, the big mathematics away from the CPU that needs to be done in machine learning. The DPU offloads 
networking from the CPU. So the network stack could live entirely on this DPU. And this is making use of the smart NIC technology, which you can think of as a high-speed networking card with an ARM chip on it as well to do further processing. And you can actually run ESXi on that ARM chip as well. So that's going to be a big future for both companies to offload segments of NSX, to offload possibly storage handlers, take drivers out of the core CPU and put them on this remote processor, if you like. Uh, so that's a big subject. We're not going to get into this subject today, but there is a huge amount of partnership going on, as you see here. We're going to talk about partnership at the GPU level, which is there today. And so uh, in particular, we're going to talk about how GPUs can be used for machine learning. So now I'm going to uh, pass the uh, baton over to my colleague, Mohan. I'll stop sharing and allow you to share, Mohan, and that will uh, take us forward. So I'm going to stop stop sharing now. Thanks, Justin. I'll start sharing. Okay. All right. So let's look at uh, what is machine learning and why we need to use GPUs. So the data for training needs needs to be prepared ahead of uh, the training phase. The, if you have garbage in from your data, you can expect garbage out, just like you would talk about garbage in, garbage out in computing. It's, it's also the case with data. So the data preparation and engineering tasks represent over 80% of all the time consumed in AI and machine learning projects. So uh, we, we just want to mention it here to make sure that you know what we hear about machine learning is usually the training part, but there's a lot of work that goes ahead uh, ahead of the time to kind of make sure that the data is uh, trainable. So it needs to be uh, brought into a format that can be trained. And the process of training refers to the process of creating a machine learning algorithm. Training involves the use of a deep learning framework and a training data set. So the data uh, sources for training come from uh, places like IoT and other devices could be retail uh, retail outlets and other places where uh, data data comes in and the training data that a data scientists can use this training da data to kind of to create models and then use it in the same areas where the data came from to kind of make automated decisions inference is where you're actually taking the uh, trained model um, and and deploying it in, in, the, in the areas of uh, interaction with customers or uh, sometimes uh, in manufacturing facilities. And that's kind of what inference comes from. So the data from a production site can be used as input to a trained machine learning model, enabling that the predictions can guide decision logic on the device. So what it does is you take, uh, you, you kind of collect data from all these sites you train your model, and as as and when you can, uh, you get the model to be pretty accurate. You then uh, deploy the model in the inference site. The inference site, uh, what are, is then used for prediction, and when when there are some exceptions where the the model did not work, we take that data and feed it back to the training data set so that the model can get better. So that's kind of the cycle of training and inference. So now, uh, when we talk about training, you uh, you would hear a lot about um, neural networks. Why why all this discussion? The reason for this is that the presence of neural networks in machine learning requires the kind of acceleration that GPUs provide. There's a parallel calculation involved to run neural networks. GPUs are known to complete a lot of machine learning types of jobs in a lot in a lot in a in an order of magnitude much less than what a CPU requires. There's a lot of matrix multiplication that happens in uh, in uh, in uh, machine learning, and the neural networks are uh, are what is leveraged. And when neural networks are leveraged, um, there is a lot of ma matrix multiplication involved. They are modeled in um, neural networks are actually modeled as software objects that model the biological neurons and their connections in the human brain. 
the human brain is a much more complex uh, organism compared to what we do in uh, machine learning and because we uh, it is really complex to model but uh, what we do in um, machine learning um, even though it models uh, brain it is it, it is only a small subset of what a brain can do the neuron fires its own signal um, in the chain and you can see uh, in the in the picture over there that uh, we have uh, different kinds of uh, inputs and then uh, the outputs. And then that's kind of how uh, neural networks uh, are leveraged. This, the software neuron, um, the output from all of these uh, the mathematic calculations within the neuron is finally sent to another neuron, which then uh, sends it to other layers. So typically um, machine learning involves a lot of la layers with neural networks. And in the next slide, you, we will see um, how uh, how uh, neurons and neural networks are leveraged for machine learning. This image shows two different neural networks in graphical form. The circles are the neurons, which you can think of as pre-processing engines for math calculations. The lines between the neurons represents the connections between them. The green layer on the left-hand side represents the inputs. The navy layers represent the hidden layers within the neural network, and these can be many hidden layers, as you can see on the right-hand side. The purple layer is, uh, neurons represent the output layer. This is the layer that produces the results from the neural network at the end of its activity. Neural networks, many layers hidden in them are called deep neural networks. That's what you see on the right-hand side. And we think about each neuron in any particular layer have operating in parallel with all its siblings in the same layer. So they operate in parallel. So every layer, the, 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 the neurons operate in parallel and that's kind of how, what uh, we leverage when we leverage GPUs. Now we look at some of the uh, common accelerated methods on VMware. Um, particularly, we look at uh, all the common accelerators that are used for machine and, and, and deep learning. So uh, there are three kinds of accelerators typically used uh, in machine learning. Uh, GPUs are one of them. Uh, GPUs came from the graphical processing unit. And the, since the graphical processing unit were, was used to process pixels for displays, which required a lot of matrix multiplication, they, uh, they, they became a natural ally of uh, doing deep learning, which also required matrix multiplication. In addition to GPUs, there are field programmable uh, uh, gateway, gate arrays, which are the FPGAs, and ASICs, um, the application specific integrated circuits that are also used for machine learning. Let's look at some of the uh, GPU methods. Right, there are three GPU methods. At the top, we show the virtual machine that represents, uh, you know, the, that represents where the compute is happening for our machine learning job. Uh, we show three different methods here. The direct path IO method, the NVIDIA vGPU method, and the vSphere distribution method. You see that there's a CUDA layer. The CUDA is the, the um, uh, driver that that provided by NVIDIA. And uh, there are more than 12 uh, versions of CUDA. And so it's a pretty mature API that's available with uh, NVIDIA products. And uh, that is leveraged to communicate with GPUs. So typically, uh, you see that the CUDA driver exists in all these different methods, but they exist in different areas. So in the case of uh, Direct path IO exists in the guest OS. Um, in the case of NVIDIA vGPU, there are two components that we need to leverage, the CUDA driver plus there is a driver at the ESX level. And then for Bitfusion, uh, there we have a Bitfusion server that has the CUDA components. Now let's look uh, at um, the direct path IO in detail. Where is a direct path IO used? It is best used in relatively static environments where you have a long running model that uh, the developer or the data scientist needs 
complete access to the GPU and uh, is very uh, sensitive to performance and they want the best possible performance equivalent to what you would see in a bare metal environment. And that's where you, that's kind of where this is used. This is the first attempt to leverage GPU. That means in an organization, when they want to try out GPUs, uh, this is the simplest way to add GPUs. Uh, uh, Direct Path IO is a uh, way uh, in vSphere where you can add um, uh, you know, a, a hardware device, device directly, uh, directly to a virtual machine. And this is kind of what we do. And in the case of uh, BitFusion, it is actually using Direct Path IO on the server side. Let's look at um, the execution flow for the Direct Path IO. So if you think about it, the application that's running on the virtual machine makes a GPU specific library call the NVIDIA libraries, that uh, the CUDA libraries that exist in the virtual machine are leveraged to handle the call. The GPU request is then passed through the hypervisor unchanged and, and is directly run on the GPU. And the GPU hardware receives the request and returns the response. So it's kind of almost like bare metal. The ESXi hypervisor just passes through the request. So if you look at the direct path IO, what are its pros and cons, right? You know, it does provide you the best performance, like we said, right? And it's a, a near native performance. It is available in all vSphere editions. You don't need a special vSphere edition for it. It's easy to deploy with a vSphere client. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, is, it can leverage initial placement. It can also support multiple GPUs per VM because uh, through direct path IO, you can map multiple GPUs to a virtual machine. And the VMware, uh, VM has direct access to the GPU memory or the frame buffer. The cons of this are the GPU is completely dedicated to a particular virtual machine, so no, no, no sharing. There's no capability to do snapshots of the virtual machine. Since the VM is bound to the physical GPU on a physical box, there is no vMotion. Only cold migration is possible. And because of this, there is a potential for underutilization of the hardware. So this is this I would rec we would recommend as the first step when you when customers want to use GPUs. This is how they start, but eventually they will need to migrate to. Uh, some uh, the next topic that we talk about, like vGPU, where there is sharing possible and capabilities like vMotion and DRS work seamlessly. So the use case for vGPU is it's best for dynamic environments. That means you know where you want the VM to be um, uh, migrated as and when needed, just like uh, other VMs in the environment. So even if the GPU attached to it, a VM can potentially move. And it also provides um, the ability for multiple users to share GPUs. You can provide fractional GPUs um, as part of the environment. So if you have uh, limitations in your GPU, multiple users can still share it by using fractional GPUs. If you look at the execution flow for uh, vGPU, like we saw in the first case, the application makes a GPU specific library call and the NVIDIA libraries in the VM's guest OS handle the call. It's then passed to the vGPU manager in the hypervisor. You see, this is different from what we saw before where we have a vGPU manager on the hypervisor it's installed in the form of a web. And then the GPU's request uh, is passed onward from the, the vGPU manager passes it on down to the physical GPU. The GPU hardware uh, handles the call and then returns the response. So it's kind of, that's one extra step here. But uh, what we've seen uh, in our performance tests is that it is uh, uh, the overhead is pretty minimal. Uh, it's in the matter. Uh, it's in like five percent or lower. So, what are the con pros and cons of uh, an NVIDIA vGPU? So, there is near direct path I/O performance. We can do vMotion 
uh, HA and DRS are also possible. We can do suspend resume. So we can actually suspend our VM and we also have a concept called VDI by day, um, compute by night, where you actually can suspend a VM that's using uh, GPUs during the daytime. Maybe people are using it for graphics in the daytime. And then you can suspend the VM and in the nighttime you can attach that same GPU that's been suspended to a VM that needs to do machine learning, uh, batch batch kind of machine learning because you run this at night. And um, you, can, uh, you can use all the GPU in the night and when the users come back the next morning, you release it back and you resume the, the desktop. So you can have VDI by day and uh, compute by night. There are multiple GPUs on a VM also supported and uh, there are different scheduling algorithms that can choose from. So cons are we do require an NVIDIA license, but the license uh, is called the vCompute server license. It's actually pretty minimal. Uh, the cost is almost like $50 on uh, a GPU per year. So it's not too expensive. To install the VIB, we need to be able, we need to shut down the host and then the, the vGPU driver version must man, uh, match the vGPU manager version. So there are some lifecycle management requirements for this to work properly. And uh, the fractional GPUs must all be the same size. So you cannot have different fractions. So that's one of the kind of limitations of NVIDIA vGPU. And it doesn't support other devices. It support only NVIDIA vGPU. Now I'm gonna pass it back to my colleague, Justin, to talk about multi-instance GPUs. Thanks very much, Mohan. One, Thank you. One I'll minute. Share, I'll share my screen now as soon as... Uh... I'm trying to... Yes. Okay. One minute. Uh, okay, there you go. Thank you. You see my screen okay? It's not in presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. You should be seeing it now, yeah? Okay. So Mohan's explained two methods of dealing with GPUs on vSphere. And the second one he was talking about, the probably more sophisticated one, was the vGPU method. That's um, software from NVIDIA done jointly with VMware. And I said we were going to talk about some advanced features here. Um, typically, uh, two virtual machines sitting on the same server with a vGPU each are sharing the same GPU. They, they, they have a, a portion of its memory, but they're actually time sliced. They're multiplexing across the cores on the GPU. Uh, and so there isn't any spatial separation between them. So what NVIDIA has now developed and is still in the works as far as uh, vSphere support, uh, it's not released yet on vSphere, it will be in, in the next year or so, is something called multi-instance GPUs. And the objective of this is to do really, to do real spatial separation of one virtual machine from another. So that all the pathways that that virtual machine is using to get to the hardware that belongs to it are separated in space, separated completely from another virtual machine that's using the same GPU. And you see that on the right-hand side here, that the extreme right-hand side is meant to represent the hardware of the GPU itself. SM stands for symmetric multiprocessors. Those are collections of the cores, subsets of the, of the thousands of cores that are on there. And there are a whole bunch of pathways to those and a whole bunch of caches and DRAMs associated with those which have been shared across the virtual GPU mechanism up to now. They're, the virtual GPUs are time sliced against it. Well, if you enable this new feature uh, called MIG or multi-instance GPUs, you're given one or more of these, time, of these slices in the hardware, which I've labeled as GPU instances here. Really, they're a, a hardware slice, a subset of the, of the GPU itself with a collection of SMs or symmetric multiprocessors Part of, the, part of the caching, part of the cores, part of the memory that are entirely yours. They, they uh, are completely dedicated to your VM when, when you choose your vGPU profile, which I'll show you next. 
So this is a, a pretty big change under the covers of, of the virtual GPU um, software that's been around for a long time. And you don't have to do anything new as an administrator here. VMware will take care of you and set all this up for you. But you can say, I'll take three of these GPU instances here, three of these slices and allocate them to one VM and three others and allocate them to the other. And then there's a, a seventh one there, GPU instance six. It so happens that they broke this down into seven components because they had 98 uh, SMs to, to share across seven or eight VMs. So they, they broke them up into seven sections here. So you choose these slices uh, by virtue of choosing the, your virtual GPU profile, which you're going to see next. And it's really now spatial separation of one VM from another in, in the actual physical GPU. So you can see here, if you look in the middle uh, at the at the NVIDIA Grid vGPU profile, that's where a system administrator is choosing exactly the share that this virtual machine is going to get. And the choice looks a little bit more compli complicated than it should, but we're going to simplify this in, in the vCenter user interface when we ship this out. Taking, for example, Grid A100 3-20C. The 20, 20 for, for, for a start represents 20 gigabytes of the total 40 gigabytes that's on this a100, which is a brand new GPU. That's what the 20 represents. The C represents compute only, meaning I'm going to be doing machine learning, not graphics here. And the three before the 20 means give me three of those slices that you saw in the previous diagram. In other words, give me three fractions of the total seven fractions across all the cores on that GPU. So this is really separating this virtual machine from any, any other virtual machine in space as well as in time on that GPU hardware. And it's a, it's a big enhancement for a cloud provider. If you're trying to provide your GPUs as a cloud provider to your users, you can absolutely guarantee that that amount of GPU power is dedicated to that VM. That's the whole purpose of this. And here's what it looks like inside a virtual machine if you do NVIDIA SMI, which is the standard tool that you would use. Uh, there's your profile on the top left hand side, three slices, that's three hardware slices, collections of SMs, symmetric multiprocessors, 20 gigabytes of memory, and I'm doing, doing compute here, I'm not doing graphics. So it's the C profile. And you can see that MIG is enabled on the right hand side here. And if you look into the memory usage, you see I do indeed have 20 gigs uh, in total there uh, to the to the right hand side under memory usage. So that's a bit like applying a resource pool at VMware. You're given your quota and you don't go outside that as far as cores or memory is concerned. Okay, so that's one new feature that we, we uh, used heavily in this piece of healthcare work that I'm going to show you. Another important part of it was the NVIDIA GPU cloud, which as I said, is going to be certified on Tanzu with VMware on the vSphere with Kubernetes platform. NVIDIA GPU Cloud, if you haven't looked into it before, ngc.nvidia.com is a huge collection of healthcare and other business area related pre-made models, pre-trained models, containers with um, uh, useful machine learning artifacts in them, which we used and you'll see in a second. But you can see that even looking at Clara here, which is that the name for the framework inside the NGC that is specifically healthcare oriented, there's a very rich collection of things to use here for a researcher working in a lab who wants to try things out. And that's exactly what we did as a test case for some of these NGC artifacts on, on VMware with Tanzu actually. And we picked the COVID-19 uh, classification pipeline, the name got cut off here in the user interface, within Clara, this is a collection of things in a pipeline. Uh, it's, it's two different machine learning models, actually, a segmentation model and a classification model, which I'll explain to you, that are operating in a pipeline. And it's, it's typically the case that you don't deploy just one trained model. You deploy a whole bunch of things together into production. That's called a pipeline. And that's what we did here. We deployed this COVID-19 pipeline onto Kubernetes. So here you see the Clara framework itself. And this is the a uh, set of things that make up the basis for these um, healthcare things. Uh, you see there's imaging, there's uh, 
uh, genomic stuff here and power bricks, but under, under the covers is Kubernetes and containers, surprise, surprise. So all of these things are deployed on Kubernetes eventually, which is the connection into vSphere and the collection, uh, connection to Tanzu. So you can read about NVIDIA Clara on the NVIDIA website at your leisure. I'm going to pick out a couple of things in the architecture of Clara here that are notable. First of all, on the left hand side, there's a collection of artifacts here, model scripts, Helm charts, containers, pipelines, and operators, a whole bunch of things that we're using here, but they're all running on Kubernetes, EGX's, NVIDIA's edge gateway system, which is a, a stripped down version of, uh, of their hardware and also a stripped down version of their software stack for data science that runs on Kubernetes. And Helm is a, is a, a sub function that is loaded into Kubernetes. Triton in the red box there represents the TensorFlow runtime that NVIDIA has tuned up for best inference. So what we're doing here is inference from um, Mohan's explanation earlier. We're not doing training, we're doing inference, but we could do training too. In fact, the NGC system uh, uh, asks you to do training by virtue of this um, fine tuning the COVID-19. So this is a collaboration area here that research scientists could work on this model and retrain it with new data to get it even more powerful. Now, what does this look like in action? So as you see at the top here, I'm just running a container to prove that I can run NVIDIA SMI from Docker. I say Docker run there just to run the NVIDIA SMI command from within the container. Following that, I'm doing a pseudo kubeadm init, uh, which is create me a Kubernetes cluster in a very simple fashion, just a one node Kubernetes cluster here. So I'm going to do everything on one node because I'm a researcher. I don't really want to deal with a cluster. I want to deal with Kubernetes because it's the platform for everything. It's the platform for final deployment, but I'm, I'm doing my work privately in my own sandbox in my own Kubernetes cluster here. So very, very simple setup. And you can see the instructions that followed there. And this is, this is using TKG, uh, the flavor of it that used to be the Heptio release, but it's using this on top of vSphere. And here's what I do to set up Clara on top of that Kubernetes. I do Clara pull the various components of Clara. Clara is a sophisticated system for healthcare with lots of things inside it. I won't go into detail, but it's got a console that we're going to see and it's got adapters and it's got the ability to read and write these DICOM images, which are uh, data standards for medical medical imaging. Um, and you can see the collection of things that are deployed when I deployed Clara there at the bottom. Kube control get pods at the bottom is all of the collections of, the, of containers. A pod is a collection of containers that represent the various pieces of the Clara framework. Now, I didn't dig into these while I was deploying it on vSphere, but they're very interesting in themselves. They contain multiple containers inside each of those pods. And as you can see, they're all running and healthy here on that Kubernetes instance. So if I dig into them a little further, I see the Clara pods in the default namespace and namespace is a Kubernetes area. Uh, and also in the kube system namespace, I see the standard components of any Kubernetes system, uh, the kube controller manager, the etcd, uh, metadata store and the scheduler there. I can see all those and, and you can tell this was an older flavor of Kubernetes because I'm running Tiller there at the bottom, which is uh, an older subsystem running on top of, of Kubernetes. Now, now to get to the healthcare side of this, <clears throat> what's actually happening is 300 of these images, these two-dimensional images are being fed into the machine learning pipeline, the Clara pipeline, and they're being analyzed and segmented, broken up into pieces. And the important parts of the images are being highlighted. The unimportant parts of the images are being uh, under highlighted or discarded that's called segmentation and that's an important treatment of medical images that's going on inside this pipeline but secondly once that segmentation is being done a classification machine learning model is reading those images and saying is this really a case of COVID-19 or not and so all of that is built into a pipeline that you see here this COVID-19 class that you see executing here this will execute and complete inside the full system and 
you can see the various pieces. There's a DICOM reader there, the DICOM writer at the bottom, and there's a lung segmentation operator. This is a piece of machine learning that's processing the lung images, 300 of them, and building new images from them that are re uh, registered with a rendering tool that we're going to see so that the research person can get a better view than they get in the individual DICOM images. They can better get a better view of what's going on inside this person's lungs. Uh, that, that is being analyzed here. So two things are going on. The images are being reconstructed using machine learning algorithms. And then the classification is being done as to whether this is an actual case of COVID-19 or not. Again, in a research setting, not in a uh, clinical diagnosis setting, purely a research development piece of work here. So here's where you see the pipeline in action. The DICOM reader is reading those images the lung segmentation is process, processing them, and the DICOM writer is writing out new images to a different store. And that is being done across two virtual machines, actually. We're using a direct path IO virtual machine and a virtual GPU virtual machine to participate in this pipeline here. We're doing it across two VMs, each of them with GPU capability under the covers of all this. This would look exactly the same if you were deploying this on any platform this is all running on vSphere 7 here. And finally, we register our images with the rendering tool. And you'll see the rendering tool in a minute. But I just wanted to point out to you that all of this is running on top of the TensorFlow runtime server that NVIDIA has as one of their containers. NVCR.io slash NVIDIA is the repository that NVIDIA has for all their containers stored on the uh, GPU cloud, the uh, NVIDIA GPU cloud. And you can see that's a sizable container. That's 7.7 .7 gigabytes of, of code there. Very big container deployed into the system. So this is a non-trivial setup. So what do I get? Well, I get these new images now that are three-dimensional volumetric images produced by the machine learning algorithm as a result of processing all the black and white DICOM images that you saw earlier. And there were over 300 of those fed into this. And the research scientist now or developer in the lab can look at this in different angles, rotate it, look at different concentrations on it, do a lot of things they couldn't have done with the original images to examine this problem and figure out what's going on in there or, or lead to uh, more knowledge about this. But that research person doesn't want to waste uh, a lot of time on false negatives or false positives. So they get some help here from the second piece of machine learning, which is this classification operator, which is also working on the same images. And the zero represents a negative result here. The number after the zero, 0 0.99, represents the probability that this is a negative result. When you get when you get results from machine learning, they're usually in probability terms. So 0 0.99 is a very, very high probability that this is not a COVID case. Uh, the one on, on the last line would be a positive result, and the probability of that is 0 0.0075, according to our classification algorithm. Now, as I said, this is not clinical diagnosis here. This is a researcher in a lab developing something. And the reason they're doing this is to work on real samples and not work too much on uh, negative samples so that they know exactly for this sample that we've just looked at, is this a negative or a positive situation as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So it's, it's classifying the, the images into one of these two categories. That's what's going on here, Class, a classification operator. Under the covers, at the infrastructure level, we were vMotioning the, those VMs around, those vGPU enabled VMs that were executing this machine learning pipeline. Uh, and we were doing the rendering using a direct path IO. So the rendering you just saw of those nice images is being done in a direct path IO VM, which of course we can't vMotion, but we can vMotion our vGPU one which is, as you see here, being vMotioned under the covers. The uh, researcher knows nothing about it, but their algorithm moved from one host to another host during the lifetime of this job, which is standard, standard practice for VMware. But to a machine learning person, this is brand new stuff. They wouldn't think of doing this. 
So the two methods we used then uh, were the direct path IO method for the rendering part of this demonstration and the NVIDIA virtual GPU method for the machine learning part for treating the TensorFlow images with all that input data, massive amount of input data for it to do inference on. And as I said, we weren't doing training this exercise, we were doing inference, which is the production use of your model, having it having been trained on previous data. So those are the two methods we used here, real life usage of it. And uh, we're going to follow now with a second use, use case within the same context, within the same piece of work that we did with NVIDIA recently, which you actually uses Spark. And for that, I'm going to pass back to Mohan to describe some more about that. And I'll stop sharing now. Thanks, Justin. Okay, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna. And Mohan, as you're sharing, I just wanna remind partners if they have questions for you or Justin, that we're asking them to please put them in the Q&A. So in the first section, uh, we looked at, uh, you know, the use of GPUs for um, doing actual uh, inference work that the Justin showed with Cla the Clara framework. So here, what we're gonna see is a Spark. Apache, Sp so uh, initially when we did the introduction, we saw that, we, we mentioned that the almost 80% of the work happens data processing happens before the training process. So Apache Spark is the, the leading platform that is leveraged by enterprises to, to do the data, the data pipelining and the data processing process, right? And then Apache Spark 3.0 now supports the use of GPU acceleration for computing. So that means you can process the data with Apache Spark and also can Send the, send the pipeline to GPUs so that uh, you can do, you can have the three key benefits of leveraging Spark on GPU. So first is the faster execution time. So data preparation time is reduced, it can also be reduced with GPUs. So why is, one minute, it's moving by itself. Sorry guys, one minute, okay. moving by itself. There might be a, a transition going on in there, Mohan, but uh, you can go back. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so there's this, uh, there's Spark orchestration that can also be used, and then you can leverage GPUs to reduce the server footprint as well. So think of it this way, right? With Spark, the data processing aspect as well has been shown to be accelerated by GPUs. So now you can accelerate your data processing and your training with GPUs, and that's kind of what um, Spark can bring you. So. The next slide, we look at another important technology. Uh, it, it, typically a Spark platform comes with uh, multiple nodes. You have uh, master nodes and worker nodes. When certain operations such as a join or an SQL or a weight reconciliation in machine learning, the Spark nodes need to swap potentially large quantities of data between them. This is known as a shuffle. This is a well-known bottleneck in these applications because when a shuffle happens, there's a lot of slowdown. There's a lot of communication that needs to happen. In ML, the shuffle data will be living in the GPU's memory. So we have this concept called GPU Direct that's going to be supported um, in uh, future versions where the GPU's memory's contents can be directly copied from the GPU into through to the Mellanox NIC card. Mellanox is a company that was per purchased by NVIDIA. So, so uh, any kind of distributed GPU computing can leverage GPU direct. And this kind of, enha this enhances the performance of the Spark shuffle phase, and it gives significantly better performance of the application or, or compared to like non-accelerated workload. So GPU direct is a very critical technology when you do distributed machine learning. And then uh, last but not the least, uh, just wanted to highlight the platform that we've used in, uh, in what Justin showed you and um, its capabilities, right? So we are here, we are leveraging 
vSphere with Tanzu. So you, you have Kubernetes and Kubernetes pods and virtual machines running on the same cluster. You, um, you know, VI admins are able to manage the environment like they manage their virtual infrastructure. So you're able to meet the needs of your developers and your uh, IT operators at the same time. You're leveraging all the components such as um, um, you know, software defined storage, network and compute. So everything, uh, everything is software defined. And, um, and you're able to leverage accelerators that uh, like GPUs and, uh, and RDMA uh, network cards that are supported in vSphere. So basically this platform has all that you need to run machine learning workloads by providing um, uh, the, the, the building blocks including the latest and greatest platform with Kubernetes where, which is supported by the Clara framework. So with this, we'll go to the next uh, slide, which is the key takeaways. VMware and NVIDIA are making significant investments to GPU. You can see that we partnered uh, together. Uh, you can even, you can see the, the, the level of our relationship through the keynotes that we had in VMworld and the, the latest, uh, even the NVIDIA had the NVIDIA GCC. VMware uh, was part of the key, two of the keynotes in the NVIDIA GTC as well. VMware Tanzu, as we showed, as Justin showed you, is a great platform to run machine learning and NGC components. We were able to run the NVIDIA, NVIDIA cloud components as well in our in our in our infrastructure. We can also, as we showed with Spark, run distributed machine learning on Tanzu with vGPU and GPU direct correct capabilities. And not, last but not the least, Apache Spark 3, which uh, is, a, is the leading uh, data processing platform can also be accelerated with NVIDIA GPUs and RDMA on the vSphere platform. Now I will pass it back to my colleague, Justin, for a demo. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you, I'll share my screen now. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can see this. Mohan, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so what we're going to play for you here is a demo that we created for VMworld and GTC uh, jointly with NVIDIA. And this will take you through the Spark parts of the, of the um, presentation that we've been giving first. It will tell you about why Spark can be used for healthcare machine learning. And then it'll take you into the second part that I described in some detail, the Clara framework and using that COVID-19 pipeline to help the researcher understand this problem better. So two parts to this and the Spark part will come first. Distributed data analytics platforms like Spark are being used in data centers everywhere to perform AI training and data processing. These platforms require a scale out approach on multiple nodes in order to perform efficiently. This scale out approach lends itself well to an accelerated virtualized environment. VMware has optimized vSphere to enable these applications to take full advantage of GPU acceleration with GPU Direct RDMA, maximizing accelerated compute and networking capabilities from NVIDIA hardware and software. Leveraging the power of accelerated virtualization, we easily deployed an eight node Spark 3.0 cluster as virtual machines, accelerated by NVIDIA A100 virtual GPUs and NVIDIA Mellanox NIX with GPU Direct RDMA. This cluster can be used by data scientists to analyze data and train models. Here we're training a model using XGBoost to predict breast cancer occurrences using a 240 gigabyte data set with over 30 features. VMware's integration with NVIDIA results in AI and ML capabilities that are accelerated faster than ever before. With Spark 3.0 on VMware, combined with NVIDIA GPUs and networking, we can train our model for this data set 31 times faster than a non-accelerated cluster. This means that a data scientist can iterate on new data and retrain their model many more times in a day, dramatically increasing their productivity. Next, let's see how modern workloads take advantage of GPU acceleration on VMware's cloud-native ecosystem. VMware Tanzu will support GPU-accelerated containers from NVIDIA NGC. 
Here we're showing how NVIDIA's Clara SDK can be deployed from NGC on VMware Tanzu and be used by clinical researchers to perform AI inferencing on imaging data. NVIDIA NGC is a repository of GPU-optimized containers, Kubernetes Helm charts, deep learning models with pre-trained weights, and Jupyter notebooks with sample code. Using VMware's Tanzu on vSphere, an IT administrator can easily deploy Kubernetes clusters for modern cloud-native applications and developers. Further, with NVIDIA's A100's virtual multi-instance GPU capability, each user can even further divide a single GPU and provide access to dedicated GPU resources for their work. Once the cluster is provisioned, we can easily pull the Clara Deploy SDK and an AI COVID-19 classification application directly onto the cluster from NGC. We can then activate a pipeline to process 3D CT scans and classify them for COVID-19 probabilities. The pipeline takes the full data set consisting of DICOM images, applies a 3D lung segmentation model, followed by a COVID classification model, and produces a 3D volumetric image in seconds. Here is the finished result, a fully interactive 3D volumetric rendering of the lungs. Okay, uh, that, that's the end of our talk today.